Exactly. And so, you know, with that said, let's talk about top versus left navigation. JT, what are your thoughts in general? I think a lot, of, you know, this is a site that we did. Um, the uh, We actually got beef jerky as a, as a prize, right? We did. We're happy with the design. They sent some awesome jerky. They launched on here at EY. But, of course, the, the old site here, Smoke Meats, is showing that last nav, and they moved up to the top nav, which get, uh, this is not quite on par with my design, but it's, it's somewhat, you know, a quality. But, JT, talk to us in general about the left and top nav and, and kind of the, the move towards that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, exactly. I mean, almost just like Don said, it's, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of sites, and I mean, even the ones we're going to review here today, where they just have a very long left nav, and, you know, it forces you know, the customer to scroll down the entire length of the home page, for example, to read all the links. And at that point, they're going to have to scroll all the way back up to the right. top to read the actual, or see the actual content on the page. Um, you know, but aside from that, aesthetically, I think it goes for a much cleaner look. Um, you know, you said it forces that consolidation. It's much easier to absorb when I'm only reading, you know, five or seven links, for example, as opposed to, like, 30 or 40 in the left nav. Right, because if you've got a left nav, then you you have vertical space that you're looking. You can put right. 40 links if you need to, whereas if you move to top, because you have the left to right restriction there, you have to be judicious about the categories that you include there. Right, and nobody wants to be overwhelmed either. Exactly, and so another thing, too, is if you're talking about a responsive site, uh, you have to be judicious. You have to be very, um, you have to get your editing pen out to really think about how we can do this. Uh, so let's go Let's go to the next one here. Eric, can I so, just real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, one thing I think is worth mentioning is, of course, it's the title of this, this, this talk, and uh, Don just said it, usability. And what I would encourage store owners to do is, get out there and browse around on as many sites as possible and you'll quickly start to see things that you like, things that are natural to you as a browser. Try to take off your store owner hat and think about being a customer right. as you you know move the mouse around and see do what feels what you think would be natural for a customer. And you'll start to see the types of things that you you know you would like and maybe and that those are the kinds the more research that you can do and the more things that you can do to figure out what other people are doing that you might like, that'll give you and inspire you for ideas so that when you when you are looking at a redesign or you are contemplating different things, that you you know, you'll have some some ideas and you'll get the best design possible out of whomever you use for a redesign. Right, exactly. Well said. So Mike, the this next part, you know, a lot of people think that when we're talking about top nav that we're we're wanting to eliminate the left navigation, and that's not the case. Now, on some sites where you've got a very limited product selection. If you've got less than 50 items, and I was reviewing a site the other day where uh, the left nav will probably eliminate that and just have the thumbnails stretch across uh, left to right. Uh, but here, what you're seeing is the left nav is reintroduced. So we eliminated it on the home page, but once they've navigated into Jerky, as you can see here, compared to the old site on the left back there, you're only showing jerky-related categories, right? So, you're, so if somebody says, I want to look at jerky, the only thing you're showing them is jerky-related products. You're not showing them smoked meats or gourmet gifts or deli stuff. Uh, that's for their section-specific navigation. Uh, Dick, anything you want to add to that? Pretty self-explanatory. What do you think? No, I'm a, I would agree. Yeah. If I, okay. I'm interested in jerky. That's, that's the only thing that I, I want to see. Right. Another JT. thing, too. JT, what what number of links would you say on the, on the left hand side? Like jerky, this number you've got eight links there. Is, is that pretty much the top end, the number of links you'd want to see on the left hand side? No, I think for uh, you know interior left nav, you know especially the section specific. Um, I mean, obviously I wouldn't show a hundred, you know, but I mean I, I would even go up to say twenty or thirty. I mean, to me this is the level where it's all right to have a lot more links because it's specific to that section that you're on. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's well said, and, and I, you know, I had this discussion the other day with the merchant uh, that was debating about the fold. You know, the fold is where you know you have to start scrolling to see more of the um, elements on the site design. And I do believe that people will scroll, but I, I think that you've got to at least establish above the scroll what people can expect below the scroll. I, I think you know the the old adage was that if you anything below the scroll was death. I don't think that's really the case now, especially with mobile, um, that people will scroll. But I think you you have to establish something that inspires them to scroll uh, versus just having surprises below the scroll. And real quick, let's go to the next one here. So for the product page, what this does, you see the, the left nav is again eliminated. With, and this is a very straightforward, very simple 
uh, layout. It's just there it is, teriyaki beef, jerky, not a whole lot of options. Um, here's the, the description. But the left now, if, if this was included, would only serve to compound uh, the, the detail when it really just needs to be streamlined. You know, uh, a lot of the product pages that JT and I come across, they have very, very small uh, product photos. And that's usually because they have a left and sometimes a right column that squeezes everything here. And this allows it to uh, be bigger and allow that, that meat to look savory and, and uh, delicious. Uh, so that's something to, to point out there. So before we get too in the weeds here, I want to talk about a navigation glossary here. So, so site frames here, let's go through all these. Talk to us about these, these various terms here. Um, the site frame is just basically the header and the footer of the entire site. It's what um, they remain consistent throughout every single step, um, sometimes not as much on the cart, but um, every other part of the site is consistent. It's where people go to for information, it's familiar. Um, and then so again, the header it includes um, typically the logo, the different categories. The and TLC link. stands for top level categories yeah. because of that second yeah, TLC definitely. part. And um, the search, uh, the first place your customers will go to if they're looking the to find site. information, correct? And then the footer is where um, sometimes people put an address bar, utility links, um, the symbols that you mentioned, right. the Norton. That's where you put Norton. Like that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's where you stick them at the bottom. Right. Um, and then, like we mentioned, the top level categories. Those are in this strings and beyond example, like the strings by exactly. instrument, strings by brand. The big categories, the plate, once they're ready to start shopping, that your customers first go to. Right. Um, utility links are um, things like my account. Um, about us, contact, contact us, us, shipping, like that. But it's um, not product specific. Yeah. In this case, String, Strings and Beyond has a lot of theirs under a little drop down under help. But, yeah, um, that's that, that my account up there. Um, and then browsing categories, um, things like new arrivals, best sellers, clearance, things like that that like that that aren't necessarily. Um, They're not product specific. Correct. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Very good. All right. So let's talk about some do's and don'ts about navigation. Now that we've gotten this, these uh, six-point glossaries aside, let's go into some do's and don'ts. Um, and all, all the, well, not all, most of the sites that we're uh, showing screen grabs of here have volunteered for review. Uh, one of these was Ferry Glenn. Uh, so, JT, what do they not need to do here? All right, don't create redundant links in the top nav and the left nav. Uh, you know, especially me as a shopper, I get confused. So if I see, for example, um, well, this one's kind of cropped. You can't really see it. But uh, let's just say, uh, like the gift ideas, for example. Like if that is also in the left nav, me seeing that smaller in the left nav and then also in the top nav, I don't know if each one of those goes to the same page right. or not. Um, you know, again, we were kind of talking about earlier, um, you know, they, Barry Glenn has a very long left nav on the page, and it pretty much runs the the whole cropping it here, right? Yeah. The whole height of the whole page. So it would force me to read through all of those. Maybe some of them are even unnecessary links that I don't need to look at. Um, you know, kind of consolidating here to the top nav. But um, you know, anytime that you've got redundant navigation like that, uh, it just creates more confusion for the browser. Well, and let's be honest. A lot of times, merchants that you know they've had this left nav or whatever for a long, long time, and and so they'll want to add some things. I think even EY helped with this one here. We've done like the rotators and whatnot, but sometimes, you know, I, I've, I've been forced to use some very drastic language, like, I want to blow up your navigation, you know, just to kind of get people's, you know, um, perspective on this, that, listen, sometimes you've got to start fresh, just like Mike did with Strings and Beyond, he basically blew up his nav and reconstituted it uh, in, in the new uh, responsive nav, but, you know, he was forced to basically blow it up, and, and sometimes you've got to do that, so let's go to the next one. Don't treat browsing categories the same way as top-level categories. So this is actually a better example here. Good example. Good example here. So just, it's very subtle, right, JT? But what is Always for Me doing that you'd recommend? So what I really like, uh, you know, about Always for Me, uh, as far as the browsing categories, they've got the best sellers, new arrivals, and sales. Uh, those are important, so they are in the top navigation bar. But as you can see, they're treated a little differently with a little lighter purple, so that they stand out. They're not product specific like your swimwear cover up. They're still there. They're still prominent. Right. But it's it's not being treated the same way. And one one reason behind that is because the eye is saying, all right, there's four main things that I need to center on that are product specific versus seven. Right. And your eye is attracted to like minded items, so you're specifically telling your subconscious eye that listen, these things are different. They're still worth your attention. 
but they're different. So let's go on to the next one. Do you consider placing browsing categories within top-level category menus? What does that mean, JT? Okay, so for example, um, you know, if we were to look at this full site, they didn't have enough room in their top navigation, so what we actually did was to pull, say, like the new rivals, uh, for example, in this one, we actually put that in each of the TLC drop-downs. So if I were to click on that new arrivals under the women's tab, it would take me to the women's new arrivals. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing, you know, if we were to click on signs or gear, uh, those also have the new arrivals link in each one of those, but it's specific to that section. Right, right, okay. And do indicate which TLC links that have flyouts, example with arrows. So same thing here, right? So, so you're implying that if with women that you can see more women-related categories with that subtle drop-down arrow, right? That's correct. And some of these examples we'll look at uh, here soon, um, they don't have any arrows or anything, so it's just a lot of top nav, top nav categories, and it's not until you actually hover over those that you actually realize that they have a fly out. It's well, support navigation. It, yeah, exactly. So, Don, let me take a, a quick break right here. What, what is your take on hover versus click to deploy? We'll talk about mega menus here in just a bit, uh, but what is, what is your take on hovering to showcase the uh, expanding menus versus clicking to expand them out. What, what's your take? Is it vary or is there a best practice there? What do you think? Um, well, I think it, it, it depends a lot on how it's implemented as well. Um, obviously, on a responsive, you can't deal with that on, on a phone because obviously you have no hover. Um, when you're looking at it on a, on a desktop site, uh, I don't have a problem with hover, but you've got to make sure if you do the hover that you do it uh, in, in a good way so that it doesn't, it, it makes it still usable. There's a lot of them that will, as soon as you move out, they disappear and they'll have little breaks and so cause some usability issues there. Um, it's nice having a hover because it's simple. You don't have to actually click on anything to see it, um, but you just have to make sure it's done well so that it doesn't, you know, doesn't make it harder to navigate because those are the things that drive me nuts is when I'll mouse over something, I'm moving my mouse and I just, you know, bump a little bit wrong and thing disappears or slides away or whatever, it does something I don't want. Um, right. That's my biggest issue with them, you know, but um, they make it nice and usable uh, from a standpoint, um, you know, and the nice thing about it is it makes it visible. Even if you say didn't have your arrows on there, the hover, you get to see it right away. Otherwise, the click, I may not notice until I go to click on it, and then I'm not sure what's going to happen when I click. Is it going to open up a nav? Is it going to go somewhere? I'm not sure. So, Yeah, I agree completely. JT, any thoughts on that? Agree, disagree? What do you think? No, I, I agree. Okay. All right, a few more slides for do's and don'ts, and then we're going to tee up Tara for her segment here, talking about the hamburger, right? Um, so do's and don'ts. Don't have two rows of stack top navigation. This is a site we're working on here, OTC Wholesale is the current site design here, and as you can see with this blue um, bar here, medicines, personal care, bath and beauty, da da da, and they've got the second row here as well. And again, you know, the, the merchant's trying to figure out, look, all these things are important, how can I fit them? And so their their option was, well, let's just create two rows here. JT, what's wrong with that? Whew, hard to read on that, mm -hmm. uh, especially that much, or that low a contrast, rather, that thin of text on those uh, the colored blue bars. Uh, just makes it very difficult. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's creating a lot of kind of visual tension up there. Um, I'm not sure if they do it or not, but for example, I've seen this on other sites where they've got two rows of stack navigation like that, but each one of those actually has a fly out. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, that's a good point. More, Especially more double fly outs, right? right? Double fly outs. So as you're hovering over one of those, and it's overlapping the categories of, uh, below it. Right. Okay. Very good. Let's go on to yes, it's organic. Don't place utility links next to or in place of TLC. So here, if you if you look below the grass line here and you see the sale, shop brand, adult, uh, you know the why organic. Yeah, and then why organic. I mean, all of these are important. And one of the comments I typically make to merchants is, listen, all this is good stuff, and I don't want to necessarily remove it from the site, but maybe we don't execute it the same way. Maybe we place it in a different area. Because it, your eye is trying to think, all right, what, what can I expect here? Uh, what can I shop? And it's, it's seeing a combination of informational as well as product-related links. It, 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 it messes up the flow, JT. Am I saying that right? How would you phrase that? No, I'm going to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, even going on the same top nav, uh, you know, we're talking about removing some of those unrelated, uh, the product-specific ones out. Um, but, I mean, even like the, the shop, notice there's like the shop brand adult, shop brand child baby. And then over there on the far right, we've got the shop fabric. I mean, I would even group similar elements together. So the ones that start with the shop, I would get those closer together. Again, it's just kind of the, the visual flow. Right. Well said. Okay. 
So one more do's and don'ts slide. Don't have crossover subcategory links in multiple top level categories. And we don't actually have a slide for this one, but what we what we typically see um, is when you've got the subcategories in flyouts, the, the real estate is so precious and so um, you know specific to that that if you take these these subcategories and put it in various top level categories there, then it it can mess the flow up. What do you think, JT? Right. Um, and also kind of a similar example, sometimes like we'll see um, where a client will have like a shop all or shop all products as mm -hmm. one of the main ones, but then some of those same categories are also pulled out in the top nav. Right. And to me, kind of going uh, back yeah. to the redundant top navigation we're talking I, about. I think the big takeaway is you've got to have a plan. Look at these, these categories as like chapter headings, and you want to tell a different story in these chapters than you do in another chapter. Right. Okay. All right, so what you're seeing here is do use the footer. Now, a lot of people overlook the footer, and I'll just put a few, um, you know, just random links here. But people, listen, if a well-designed footer will get some clicks. It will get eyes on it. Uh, this is one from our client, Toy Wiz. Is that right? Is that yes. Toy Wiz? And so as you see here, he's, you know, he's got columns for the about, my account, order help, the toys policies. All this stuff is very important, but it's not, t it's here in the footer, it's not taking away from the product related links that you would find in the header. Also has the social media links, the uh, the trust symbols, and you can also put some things in the header that you could also put in the footer. Like you know, you might put here uh, another instance if you're toll free. Uh, a lot of people think redundancy is terrible. Redundancy can actually be very good from a usability perspective, provided it's done in the right way. Uh, you just want to be very judicious about what you are redundant about. JT, right and. You know, over the past couple of years, too, I mean, you see, like Eric said, a lot more people using the footer, almost kind of as a mini help center, a mini resource center, mm -hmm. to where, you know, I mean, we look at sites back when I first started, you know, say eight years ago, where it was basically just, just an afterthought, right? Yeah, it was just an afterthought. Yeah. It was just kind of a cap off the bottom of the page. You had, like, the copyright and maybe a couple credit card icons, and that was it. Whereas now, uh, you know, like Eric said, repeating a lot of the same kind of links down there. But I think the thing, you know, the biggest takeaway here is to have it structured. Um, you know, you still don't want it to be like a catch-all, you know, to where, say, if it didn't fit in the header, don't just throw it in the footer. I mean, to me, you still have to have that structure down there, especially with the way things are going with uh, responsive, you know, and thinking how this is going to rearrange on mobile. Still lay it out in a way to where, you, even though you've got a lot of content down there, it's still structured and still easy to read. Right, exactly. So, Tara, the hamburger. We've teed it up here, <laughs> and, it, and it's here. The hamburger. And Don, you were actually thinking it looks more like an egg McMuffin. Is that right? With the yeah, you know, I've, I've had some people comment that yeah, it's more like an egg McMuffin since they're all even. You know, because some of these burgers nowadays, you know, it's either really big or really small in the middle. But uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I tried to find a hamburger graphic here where they were relatively even. I spent a good time. Should have just like a juicy like photo of a hamburger. You know, it's like that's not happening. I haven't had lunch but, uh, Right. Okay. <laughs> so, but we, we we've also talked about you know, responsive specific navigation. And this is one of the key tenets of current responsive navigation. And a lot of people, there's kind of a debate about this in the user experience com uh, community. Some people hate the hamburger. They want to see it die. Uh, and some feel like it's an established part of usability. So a lot of debate ranging, uh, raging right now about the, the, uh, the hamburger. But Tara, tell us what it's all about. All right, I'll give you guys, oh. First table pull. <laughs> uh, hopefully you know what the hamburger icon is. You see it on responsive sites. When did you first come across these three lines for the hamburger? Where did you first notice this? Up there. We're rolling lots of folks coming through here. All right, let's close the poll and see our results here. So about 58, was it 58%? Yeah, 58 percent. Was on the website. Don, what are your thoughts on those results there? About what you figured? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much what I figured. You know, it's one of those things. It's it's becoming more commonplace, but still, uh, there's a lot. I mean, you'll talk about it, but there's a, a lot to be done or not done with it, frankly. Um, right. But yeah, it's about about what I expect. Okay. Yeah. Well, Tara, take us through it here. All 
All right, the hamburger icon was first actually invented in the 80s by Norm Cox, who worked for Xerox. Um, he, um, Xerox came out with a product called Xerox Star that was the first graphical user interface that we've seen. Um, and he, Norm said that he designed it to look, to mimic the look of a menu list. But then after Xerox Star, we kind of saw it disappear for a couple of it decades. It went off the grid for a while. It did. Yeah. Um, and then it was first resurrected um, as a voice memo for iPad. Mm -hmm. And here we see a screenshot of it being used in the first Twitter app, which was Tweety for iPad. And also, I think what a lot of, where a lot of people first started seeing it, at least where I first started seeing it, I guess apparently only 12 Facebook, yeah. Well, it was Facebook. So, right. um, it started out as kind of a little square icon. Um, and then Facebook slowly migrated to use it as a, in the middle picture, you see it used as a dash, or as the dash is the normal, and then I've seen that used a couple times where people pair it next to another image. Right. In this case, it's your profile drop-down on the right um, of the middle Facebook lens. It's not just the three lines. Or something. So Facebook really was, in, was um, pivotal in streamlining how the um, hamburger was going to be used. And then you see on the right a example of it, how it, functions. Um, the hamburger's really become an industry standard. You mm -hmm. see it um, more and more on um, not just used in apps, but used on mobile, mobile websites. And I've even seen some examples where people are using it on their desktop right. website as well. I've seen that too. It's not just specific to mobile or tablet. Exactly. It, you actually see it in conjunction with yeah. the desktop. It's truly become a recognizable image as meaning menu. Well, and, and as we go to the next slide here, you know, one of the things that um, as we talk about usability, one of the biggest tenets of, of usability is to bank on what people are used to. You know, you, you, you're trying to get people not to think. And so if, if the more that this is a commonly accepted icon, uh, you know, you want to not challenge that. You want people to feel comfortable and not have to make them figure out, all right, where do I go uh, to look at the navigation, for example. So this sample here on the left, it's a, a site that was submitted for today's webinar called Magazine Line. You can see what they're doing here. And they're doing something a little bit different than what we commonly put on some of our responsive sites. Uh, if you see there on the far right, uh, to, the, to the right of the search, they've got the hamburger and it expands out. It's kind of an accordion menu uh, for the way they're doing their categories, where, whereas a lot of times when we do the menu, it flies out from the left. Um, and so, it, you know, we're, we're seeing that. Another thing here on the Ranger Up example uh, is we, we started doing this a lot. and see with the Yahoo app. I don't know if they copied us or somebody else. <laughs> but we're doing a lot of the, uh, I'm kidding with that. Don't send hate mail. Um, with the, uh, the menu spelled out underneath the three lines. Because some people, even though it is a commonly accepted icon right now, they still don't know what that means. Uh, we can look at a site here if we've got time about how they're using it very subtly. And you've got to be very specific about, hey, this is the menu button. You want to click on this to expand it out here. Um, JT, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing there? Yeah, I think, you know, a big thing, too, is, like, I think it depends on your target audience. You know, if you're appealing to, uh, you know, a lot of the millennials that are used to being on their smartphones, um, you know, Facebook, obviously, that uses the icon, they're going to be familiar with that. So I think you can get away with a little bit more. Uh, but I mean, I think you know, just in terms of best practices, I like it when the word menu is actually kind of incorporated into the menu icon because uh, it's clear. So like, you don't have to think about it. Like it says, it says what it is. Um, you know, again, aside from the word menu, I mean, we've seen this to where you know it says nav instead. Uh, but I think you know an important thing too is like anytime that we put one of those, is make sure that it stands out in the header. Uh, sometimes it's too commonly like it looks like it blends in with the logo or it matches all the other icons in the header. And to me, that that's a little poor usability because it kind of blends in, um, just like that Ranger Up example, you know, where it's the it's the bold yellow. We hadn't used that anywhere else on the site, so it just really stands it pops out. out. It pops. Yeah. Right, right. Um, well, let's talk uh, about mega menus here. And like Don said, a lot of the when we're talking about mousing over versus clicking, mega menus are specific to desktop use. They're not for tablet or mobile uh, because, as we all know, there is no such thing as mouse over uh, for tablet and mobile, like Don said. But mega menu, especially for desktop, can be a great way to create visual interest in subcategories. But let's talk about some uh, do's and don'ts there. Uh, like I said, there are for desktop usage. Go, yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. All right. So the first thing is throw every single subcategory in there. Don't do that. So this is an example of a site that's doing this right now. They've, uh, you know, as you mouse around their various 
categories, it varies. You know, sometimes they have eight to ten categories, and they've got you know dozens like this. Uh, they also have, we'll talk about this here in a second, but this example has just a picture there. It's not clickable to anything, and it's just kind of there. It's just kind of eating up space, and there's a lot of unused space underneath that. Uh, don't make all your subcategory links all caps if you can avoid that, especially if you've got a long list. You want to be very careful about making sure that is a very legible list, and doing small all caps like that can, can be a killer. All right? uh, don't include non-clickable or obscure imagery. All right? So uh, we looked at the, um, uh, the example previous where they just had a, a product like that. You can't click to anything, so it's kind of a bait and switch, very bad for usability. That can hurt you, all right? And don't and make sure you have a you don't wait. I'm sorry, go back. That you don't have a huge spatial variation between menus. So here in this um, this size example, you can see that one is very very long, one's very small. You've got to have kind of an average between that. Now, if you remember back on Mike's for Strings and Beyond, his mega menus were all very different. Uh, it wasn't like it was one formula that stretched across the site because the content was very different. Uh, with each. It was the same basic uh, dimensions, right, JT, for, for that, but the way that we handled the layout was, was very different. So if you're going to be different, make sure the layout uh, changes accordingly. And I think, you know, one thing going on that this example we're looking at, I think you can always look at doing columns as well. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is, the, like, the, like Eric was talking about, the vertical jump from one. You know, as I'm hovering over each of those top level categories, one has 10, one has 4, and the other one has like 20, you know, my eyes just jumping around the page. So you know, if you've got 20 or 30 or something like that, look at breaking that up into multiple columns so that as I'm scrolling across each of those top level categories, the fly out, um, you know, is, is all pretty consistent as far as the height. Right. Okay. Yeah, what, one other thing, Eric, real quick on that, just, yes, a, just a quick note also, is if they've got a lot and they don't figure out a good way that they, you know, they can't break its columns easy or something like this, they could have it coded so that it will show the top, you know, first number of sections and they have like a link at the bottom that says, you know, more or more sections or something like that. To help shorten that up a bit. So, exactly. So you can click right to that that main category. That's exactly right. So the um, the first one in the foreground here is from Amazon. Uh, you can see how they're uh, have their what to wear this spring guy, and he's kind of breaking the border. Kind of a cool effect that we've we've done on some stores as well. And the one behind it is actually from Home Depot. But what you're seeing with both of these is they're grouping, uh, especially with Home Depot. So they've got lumber and composites there. And like with, even with that little orange arrow, it's very subtle, but it's very clear that if you click on lumber and composites, that takes you to the overall landing page. Whereas if you want to go specifically to the subcategories landing page, you can do that as well, but it's grouped underneath lumber and composites. Uh, you know, one of the questions we got was, you know, how do we work with navigation where it's, you know, you've got a ton of various categories? Well, Home Depot is a great example for you. Amazon is, is as well. Um, of course, theirs with Amazon, they don't really have a top nav. You know, they've got so many departments that all of their navigation is hid under the shop by department. So when you mouse over shop by department, you see all of these subcategories, and when by mousing over that, you see the mega menus fly out from there. It's a little bit different with Amazon, uh, but I don't know if it's a, a true apples to apples comparison, at least for a lot of the people listening to the webinar, because you're not a generalist superstore like Amazon. At least I hope you're not. Uh, you've got, you know, typically niche stores um, that, that need to behave a little bit differently in terms of navigation. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, do limit the number of sub, uh, excuse me, subcategories there. We talked about uh, consolidation earlier, and like uh, Don just said, include a shop all link or see all is it, is it in this example if they don't all fit. So in this example, this is a site that we did uh, with cleaning and detailing as you mouse over. Even from a consolidation for the top level categories, they really have three top level categories, and they have gift guy and best sellers treated in blue. Like JT said earlier, you want to treat those a little bit differently. But when you mouse over cleaning and detailing, notice how even for, you know, ordinary household products like this, it put a little bit of a visual flourish for people to recognize hand duster versus just a, a link that doesn't have any kind of visual attached to it. And that's only possible if they were able to consolidate. If you had, you know, 25, 30 categories, it would be a lot tougher to pull off. Okay. Let's go on the next one. Okay, yeah, feature best sellers in larger displays. The example here is micro, microfiber mops. You know, they sell a ton of these things, and so that gives some real estate dedicated to a best seller or have to kind of change up the layout. Okay. Um, 
do make sure there are clear ways, and this is Mike's example here, there are clear ways to browse general categories in addition to specific subcategories. JT, you want to unpack that a little bit there? Yeah, for example, in this one, um, you know, the material and the style, I mean, or the pick style, both of those have different subcategories, so we wanted to call those out a little bit differently, uh, almost treated in more of an ad-like fashion at the top, uh, to where each of the little yellow links are clickable directly to that section. A little bit different way to lay it out as opposed to just doing a, you know, a column title with all the subcategory links under it. But, you know, aside from just the subcategories, we're also featuring some of Mike's most popular brands that he sells. Um, is those the four logos, or sorry, five logos going across, as well as we've got a couple other sections down there at the bottom uh, for the bulk pick, signature picks, and the jazz picks. Right. And, and I want to interject something here real quick. You can leave that up, Tara, but I want to interject that, you know, just because we're talking about mega menus and all this, this is just, this does not mean that we recommend this for every store owner. I mean, it's, it's right for Mike. Uh, maybe not right for your store, um, you know. And, and there's there's no one way to do mega menus, is there, JT? I mean, you know, it, it's got to be specific to your brand, to your industry, to your products. Um, and so, the the cool thing about mega menus, you can get creative with it. You can get creative about how the visuals are displayed to solve specific uh, navigation problems. I think they're a good tool, not necessarily the tool to to put on every store, uh, but certainly, you know, we we do them a good bit with some of the stores we we create. Right. Um, make sure do make sure the text is very legible and not too tightly spaced. Uh, space is a big component of usability. Make sure you've got um, specific real estate laid out there. Okay. We've got another poll, Tara. All right. How do you feel about your current category system? Yeah, we're talking a lot about consolidation, so do you feel like you've consolidated enough? Do you feel like uh, your usability is exactly where it needs to be? Are there some changes it needs to make? So how, how do you feel about your store in regards to a lot of what we're discussing here? All right, let's show the results there. Right, so 44 percent said they're pretty satisfied with it. Okay. So Don, what, what's, your, what's your take on what you're seeing there with the polls? Probably kind of even eat there as far as too full and bloated and and the yeah, last well, one sure I it, when I look at that I also see that really it's like 56 percent are right. happy with their with it even though right. it looks like you know the majority are happy they're really not if most are not happy it's just two different categories for it mm -hmm. um, you know they know they have an idea they what to do or they don't have an idea what to do but either way they're they aren't happy with it and it's tough it's tough when you look at your products trying to figure out the best ways to categorize um, you know, and there's different ways you can you can categorize by product. You can categorize by the type of shopper. Um, you know, and they can all make sense. So every store is a little different. Right. 